Mare Biber să سيد المرسلين وحبيب الله العالمين عبد القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين المنتخبين المظلومين الغرر الميامين سيما بقيه الله في العربين وحجته على الخلائق اجمعين سيدنا وامام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي الأمرنا محدي هذه الأمة وتوسع أحل الجنة على هجة ابن الحسن الأسكري فداه ورواه العالمين سلام اللهم صل على محمد محمد I'd like to begin today's lecture with a narration for the youth and then from there we'll progress forward towards our topic which was looking at the verses of the Holy Quran that have been revealed <coughs> in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam today and tomorrow I believe are the last two lectures that we have and on the eve of the Shabi Ashur which will be Tuesday night for us will be the day or the night so to speak which is one of the most difficult nights for Ali Muhammad so today and tomorrow <coughs> the Messiahs I would like to extend a little bit longer so that we can speak about the two personalities that we have left, namely Abu Fadl al-Abbas and Ali al akbar Tonight, inshallah, I will recite the Musibah of Abu Fadl al-Abbas, and then tomorrow I will do the Musibah of Ali al akbar So the story goes as follows. Luqman <coughs> was one day traveling with his son. And he says to his son, when you live your life, no matter what you do, people will always have something negative to say towards you. Somebody will always have something to say about what you've done. You get that? There'll always be that one. So he says, Father, explain further. <clears throat> so Luqman salam says, We are traveling into the marketplace with a donkey. He said, Yes, Father. He said, Let me show you what I mean by what I'm saying. So what happens first? Luqman is sitting on the donkey while his son is walking alongside him. They're walking through the marketplace and people say, Look, does the dad have no shame that he's making the son walk while he relaxes on the ride and goes through the marketplace? First criticism. Then he switches positions and places his son on there and then he starts walking and the people say, Then his bachinu sharam ni amri. Bap is walking while he's relaxing on the donkey travel. So then what he does is both of them get on top of the donkey and ride through the marketplace. And then he hears a few individuals saying, how bad are these two individuals? It's not boj donkey Then what does he do? He gets off, he takes his son off. They walk on either side of both donkeys and he still hears an individual saying from within the crowd, they've got a donkey and they don't even know how to use it. Luqman al-Islam says to his son, Oh my son, we have done all the possible ways of journey through the marketplace with this donkey. There were only four ways that we could travel. We've traveled all four. However, if you notice, there was always somebody criticizing us about how we do. Therefore, oh my son, <clears throat> when you live your life, know that you will not be able to please everybody. When you live your life, you will not be able to make everyone happy. They say that if you make, or if there's a person who everybody loves, and no one has any sort of hate towards that person, then that man has no morals. He's a crowd pleaser. He's somebody that just goes with the flow and agrees with everyone. So if they say, oh, that person is so great, he has no enemies, well, I'd be concerned about that person. Because when you stand up for the truth, when you, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam said that if you stand for the truth, you will find it a lonely path. The truth is a lonely path, there's no doubt about that. You know how, <coughs> as Shias, we get told, why is it that you guys are such a small minority? While we, mashallah, you know, we're 80% of the Muslim population, and they say it with pride. 
We say to them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the glorious Quran that the majority of mankind will go to hell and the minority will always remain on the truth. Majority. It's not about numbers, it's about quality. If it was about numbers, then on the day of Ashura, Abba Abdullah would have had more than 72 or 73 companions, would he not? <clears throat> on the journey from Makkah to Medina, and then uh, from Medina to Makkah, and then from Makkah all the way to Karbala, do you know how many people came towards Abba Abdullah and asked if they could join him on this journey to Kufa initially, and he rejected them and said, no, you cannot accompany me on this journey. So it's not about numbers, it's about quality. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says within the glorious Quran that you will always find a few people on the path of truth. Let's take a look. The truth within Islam split when the Holy Prophet left this world and Amir al-Mu'mineen was usurped of his rights. When Amir al-Mu'mineen was usurped out of his rights, the people had forgotten Amir al-Mu'mineen. They had forgotten what he has done for them. They had forgotten over the fact that had it not been for Abu al-Hasan, all of you would have been dead in the battlefield or you would have ran away from the battlefield never to return. We've discussed the wars of Amir al-Mu'mineen and we've looked. Inshallah today we'll move on forward by looking at a few verses of the Quran that honor the commander of the faithful. Surah Naba of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the first verse by saying, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, Amma Yatasa'alun Anin Naba al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and what is it that they dispute over? The great news, Naba al So when they say they dispute over this, whatever it is, it's the great news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah then says, Kalla sayya'lamun. Thumma kalla sayya'lamun. They will come to know, indeed they will come to know. Okay. Again, when you look at the onset of this verse, it could mean literally anything. The great news could be when the Prophet came into this world. The great news could be the battles and the victories within the battles. So again, as we always say, if you don't understand the verse of the Quran, you come to the door of the Ahlul Bayt. If we go to the tafsir that have been written by the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam or ascribed towards them, they will say that in the battle of Sifin, Amir al-Mu'mineen was standing with his army. The opposition was standing in front of him. One individual who was coming from the army of the opposition comes towards Amir al-Mu'mineen and is reciting verses of the Quran. And he was saying, Amma yatasa'alun anin naba'il adim. But he's on the opposition side against Imam Ali alayhi salam. So when he recites this verse, Amir al-Mu'mineen says to him, Oh man, these verses that you have just recited, do you know who they were revealed about? Or in other words, he said, do you know what the great news Naba al Adim is? And he says, no, Amir al-Mu'mineen. Oh, no, yeah, I don't know what this means. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, Ana Naba al Adim. SubhanAllah. He says, I am that great news that you will dispute over. Meaning what? Meaning my khilafat and my successorship towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is the biggest dispute within the Islamic Ummah. And if you think about it, it's relatively true. It's the Khilafat that divided us from the other Muslims. Yes, we have other differences as we discussed earlier, that their Prophet is different, their God is different. But even though those differences occur, the reliance and successorship of Amir al-Mu'mineen is the main difference that we have between other schools of thought within Islam. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen says that when Allah says, ثُمَّ قَلَّا سَيَعْلَمُونَ Indeed, they will come to know. He said, oh man, you will in come to know about what? About my wilayat when? He said, you will realize this on the day of judgment. That is when you will understand who the Naba al adim is and that my wilayat was the great news from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at that moment, it will be too late for you. At that moment, you will not have a chance to repent as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. That as you are living in this world, do astaghfar to me as much as you can. For when you die, you cannot change your actions. Whatever you are leaving this world with, that's all you have. The only thing that can benefit you is if your family members were to recite some Quran and to say, Ya Allah, I would like to bless the deceased with this. Or if you were to hold a majlis and you would say, Oh Allah, this majlis is for the Isali Salaam of the Marhum. 
or if your children, for example, were to offer the prayers that you missed, etc. Other than that, you yourself can't do anything after you have left this world. Therefore, it is recommended that whilst you are alive, repent towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go back towards your Creator, and don't wait until the last minute. They say every single person thinks everyone will die. Man, anyway. It doesn't matter how old that individual is, ask him. Ask somebody that's 80 years old, for example. Ask him, how's life? He will say, I'm happy, I'm living my life. He won't think about his death, and mashallah, the Bazurg in the back are laughing, so that means they agree. 100%. If you were to think about it, you would think you yourself are very young. You will think, nothing's going to happen to me. Yet death is a certainty that occurs before our eyes on the daily basis. There isn't a single person in this world, irrelevant of which religion they follow, that denies death. Death is a yakini thing that everybody accepts. Yet at the same time you will say, I'm not going to die, everybody else around me will die. So you don't think about this. Why? It's because we're attached to this world. We feel that this world is such that we want, as they say, expensive cars and expensive houses and all these things. And we become so attached to it that we don't realize that all this is temporary. If you were to look at how the Ahlul Bayt speak about this world, you will come to detest this world. Amir al-Mu'mineen once said, I have given this world three talaqs. Meaning what? I have disassociated myself from this world. I will not allow this world to corrupt me. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt have said, death for a believer is excitement, it's rejoicing, it's being happy. It's like having a garment that is dirty and you take off the dirty garment and change it to fresh garments. That's what death is for a believer. It's also been referred to the Imams of Ahlul Bayt where they've said death is such, it's as if your body is dirty and you then go and take a bath and perfume yourself. That difference is death. But unfortunately, when we think about death, we don't see it as a joyous thing, do we? We don't see it as a, as a time of happiness. How do we see death? A lot of us fear death. A lot of us say, Ya Allah, I don't want to die. A lot of us say, others will die, I won't die. And the reason why is because we haven't focused enough about what death is. We don't have enough ma'rifa of, of mouth yet. But understand that once you know what death is, you will be craving for the moment you get to meet your Lord. You will be craving for the time where the angel of death will come and take your soul. But you'll see throughout history that everybody on their deathbed always has regrets. Everybody on their deathbed always says, Oh, I wish had I done this, had I done that. Nobody on their death will say, I have succeeded. Except Amir al For when he was struck in the mosque on the 19th of Ramadan, what did he say? He looked up towards the skies and he says, Fustu I swear by the Lord of the Kaaba, I am successful. What did he mean? He meant that I am successful for whatever I wanted to do in life I have done. I am satisfied with everything that I have done. Therefore, I was born in the house of God. I have been martyred in the house of God. And my life was between the two houses of God. Therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib is successful. No one before him or after him has ever said this statement. But why did he say I am successful? It's because he understood mouth. He understood what death was. Human beings psychologically fear what they don't know. If there's something that you don't know, you will fear it. We don't know death. That's why we fear it. Therefore, educate yourselves on death, and you will see that it's not something to fear, but it's something to await. It's something to look forward to. And especially for the Shias, we've got another reason why we crave death. SubhanAllah. Not just the fact that we will be reunited with our Lord, not just about the fact that we leave this temporary world. We crave death. Because we have narrations that say that upon the moment of death, we all get to see the blessed face of Abu Hassan Ali ibn Abi Talib. You get to see the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who doesn't want to see the face of Ali ibn Abi Talib? They say that one day somebody came towards our fourth Imam alayhi salam. And they said that the narration that Ali ibn Abi Talib is visible at the time of death, is this only for the believers or is it for everyone? 
This is narrated within Bihar al Anwar where the Imam replies back and says, It's not just the believers, everyone that dies sees the face of Amir al Mu'min. Everyone. So then he raised a question. He said, Oh, Imam, I understand why the believers see Amir al Mu'mineen, but why will the disbelievers see Amir? What's their purpose of seeing his face at the time of death? The Imam salam said, a reward for the believers is they will see the face of Imam Ali at the time of death so they can be happy and rejoice. Over what? Over the fact that Alhamdulillah we were on Sirat al Mustaqeen. We were on the right path. That we see the face of our Mawla at the time of death. The Imam then said, the reason why the disbelievers and the Munafiqun will also see the face of Abu Hassan is so that they will see the face of Amir al Mu'mineen and they will realize that they were wrong. And they will realize that they had followed a path that was not the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their visitation of the face of Amir al Mu'mineen is to show them that you were wrong, is to make them realize. The pain that they will face when they see Amir al Mu'minin and realize that they were wrong. It is not just at the time of death. Amir al Mu'minin says that your journey through death is linked with me. Every step. How? When your soul is leaving your body, Amir al Mu'minin comes. When the angels question you in your grave, Amir al Mu'minin comes. In Barzakh, Wadi al Salam is in Najaf and was buried in Najaf, Amir al Mu'minin. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't hold limbs. So who's going to be the judge of Allah on the day of judgment? Amir al-Mu'mineen. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to distinguish between heaven and hell, Amir al-Mu'mineen will say, Ana kasimun nari wal jannah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing you that you can't escape Imam Ali alayhi salam. You can't turn away from him. No matter how much you try to place him forth throughout your entire journey, from the life before this, from this until the next life, Amir al-Mu'mineen will always be there to make you realize that you were wrong. To make you realize that you were not following the path that you were supposed to follow. The great news is what? It is Amir al Mu'mineen. He is the great news sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not just Amir al Mu'mineen who said this, but even the Prophet has been narrated to have said, The great news is Amir al Mu'mineen. So it's not just that we have it from Amir al Mu'mineen himself. When I was saying educate yourself on death, Imam Ali said, Death is a time, he gives an example, a parable. He says, mankind is asleep, they will wake up when they die. So for a second, if you think about it, mankind is asleep, but they will wake up when they die. What do you mean, Ya Ali? We're alive right now, we're going to die when we die. But he says, no, right now you're asleep. When you die, that's when you will wake up in reality. And you will see. And we crave death for the basis that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us a reward for the life that we are living in this world, which is what? which is following the Prophet correctly and then following the path of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Think about Karbala, think about Shabi Ashur, and think about the day of Ashura, and think about the companions and the family members of Aba Abdullah, who at the time of death were rejoicing and were happy. If you look at the maktal that was written by people who were present in Karbala, who were journaling the events of the battle, they're known as the Makatil. If you were to read them, you will see that on Shabi Ashur, you will see that the companions were conversing with each other. And one of them was saying to the other one, I can't wait to go out to fight tomorrow and achieve martyrdom in the path of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. The other one would say, I can't wait to achieve martyrdom in the path of Imam Hussein. If you were to look at this, you will think for a second, what is this? You guys are going to go to war tomorrow, you're going to die. But instead of being sad or trying to prevent the war, you're actually happy and you're rejoicing over the fact that you're going to die. Do you know why? Because they had man of the world. They knew what death meant to them. It was as if they could already see their station in heaven with Rasulullah. Hur, on the eve of Ashura, saw this exact thing. He was between heaven and hell. And he chose to leave hell and join the army of Abba Abdullah and Abba Abdullah guaranteed him heaven and even prayed Salat al-Mayyad over his body. Yet where was Hur headed first? To the depths of hell. And today he is Hur alayhi salam. He is Hur who has a mausoleum and a shrine in Iraq. He is Hur who we go and do ziyarah to. He is Hur who we ask permission from Allah and the angels and the prophets before entering into his shrine. So look what Hur has achieved. Why? 
because he followed the path of the wilayat of the Ahlul Bayt. He didn't deter off the path. I'll give you an example. Misa al Tamar. You've all heard of the name of this loyal companion of Amir al Mu'mineen. How did he see death? Amir al Mu'mineen says to him one day, Oh Misa, shall I tell you how you're going to die? He says, Of course, go ahead. So they're walking through the streets of Ufa and there was a tree that had not yet sprouted to its fruition, but it was at the beginning stages. So it looked more like a plant than it did a tree. Amir al Mu'mineen walking past, he looked at him and he said, Oh Misa, see this tree? He said, yes. He said, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad will hang you from this tree. So now what would you think generally? If somebody was to tell you that this tree is where you're going to get hung, I'd say 99.9% .9 of people would go and just rip that plant out of the ground. And can't even find it. If this is where I'm going to die, I'm going to rip it out of the ground. But you know what Misam did? Every day from that day until his death, he came himself and watered that. He watered that tree every single day to make sure that that tree comes into full fruition. And when he was in the court of Ibn Ziyad after, and he was standing with Mukhtar, there was a narration where just before they killed Misam, Ibn Ziyad said, Oh Misam, is there anything that I can do that will make you stop saying Ali Ali? Is there anything that I can do to make you stop talking about Imam Ali? Is there any way you can stop? <coughs> so Mukhtar is standing next to him. He smiles and he says, yes, of course. So Ibn Ziyad said, what's that? He said, if you kill Mukhtar, I'll stop praising him. So Mukhtar turns towards me. I'm your friend and you're saying to the enemy, kill me. So Misim smiles and he says to Mukhtar, you haven't understood Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, what do you mean? He said, Amir al-Mu'mineen told me that you will be the one that will kill Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Therefore, there is no way in hell that he can actually come and kill you. So what does that mean? Misim said, that means that I have so much certainty in the words of Ali. That I know this act will never be able to happen. In other words, what Misa was saying was, no, I will not stop praising my Amir. So Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad takes him outside, hangs him on the tree, kills him. And what does Misa say before he dies? He says, even if you were to cut me, and even if you were to burn my body, and even if you were to spread the ashes across the earth, even then, my ashes will say Ali, Ali. <laughs> This is Misam. Why? Because he understood mult, he understood death. Let's take one more companion. Hujr ibn Adi. A companion of Amir al-Mu'mineen that is buried in Syria, in Sham. <coughs> he was one of the staunch supporters of Amir al-Mu'mineen during the time of his own Amir al-Mu'mineen's Khilafat, whilst Bani Umayya was ruling at the same time. Muawiyah had gathered Hujar ibn Adi and his son and a few of the companions of Imam Ali, he gathered them together and just before execution, he said to them, if you stop praising Ali, I will let you go. If you keep mentioning Ali, I will kill you. All of them said, we will happily die knowing that we are praising our Amir. So he says, fine. He begins to kill all of the companions until Hujar and his son are left. Then he looks at Hujar and says, do you have any last requests? Hujar said, yes. He said, what's that? He said, kill my son first, then kill me. So the executioner says, uh, it's a bit of a weird request if you think about it. You know, as a father, you, would, you want to see your son die? I mean, normally you'd think that the father would say, do you know what, kill me first, so I don't have to look at my son die. How difficult it is for a father to see their son die. Yet Hujra said, no, kill my son in front of my eyes and then kill me. So when the executioner asked him, why do you want to do it this way? He said, because I have lived my life in the hope of Ali so much that there is no way you can deter me from the path of Ali ibn Abi Talib. There's no way you can deter me. However, my son is young. My son may not have that ma'rifah of Ali ibn Abi Talib that I have. If he sees his dad die and he becomes so emotional, he becomes so grief-stricken 
that you never know he may leave the path of Ali ibn Abi Talib in order to save his own life. And I cannot accept my son leaving the path of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Therefore, I would rather see him die in front of my eyes so that when I die, I can proudly meet Amir al-Mu'mineen and say, Ya Ali, not only did I die in your path, here is my son who also sacrificed himself. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. When Qasim alayhi salam was asked, how do you see Mawt? He said, sweeter than honey. So all this links back to what? If you want to understand Mawt and death, understand that it is a rejoicing thing for a believer. And we can go throughout history and look at many examples of people who were happy towards death. And at the same time, there were many people that weren't happy towards death. There were many people that regretted death. There were many people who on their deathbed prayed and wished that they hadn't even been born yet. Who were they? They were the ones who left the path of the Ahl of Day. For example, the first Khalifa. On his deathbed, he regretted something. What was it? The books of narrations have been written. History and literature exists. For those who want to seek the truth, the truth is there. Go read it. On his deathbed, he said, I regret the attack on the house of the Prophet's daughter and then the injury of her that I had commanded the people to do. So in a way, he's regretting death. He's realizing that right now I'm going to die. And I have to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second Khalifa, what did he do? He wished for something even worse. On his deathbed, he said, Oh Allah, I wish that you hadn't created me a human. He says, Oh Allah, I wish, now this one's a bit uh, different, but he said, Oh Allah, I wish that you had created me as grass so that a sheep could eat me and then pass it through its system. And whatever comes out of the system, that would have been better for me than this life. So that means that on the place of death, they are realizing what? They are realizing that they have made the mistake and that death will show them the true reality. Yet at the same time, you look at the Ahlul Bayt and their companions and their followers and their Shias who at the time of death smile and rejoice and are happy for not only will we meet Amir al-Mu'mineen, but we will be promised everything that we were promised whilst living in this world. Subhanallah. So that's the difference between death and life. And the great news, Nabai al-Azim, is a news that you will see when you pass away and go into the next life. Another verse that has been quoted in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen, won't have time to go into the tafsir of the verse, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Nisa, Obey me, obey the messenger, and obey those amongst you who have been vested with authority. Or those amongst you who have been vested in authority. Who are they? They are Amir al-Mu'mineen and the family of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Allah wa atiyu rasul Obey Allah, obey his messenger. Wa ulil amri minkum. And those amongst you who have been vested with authority. Now you follow it through. If they say, Ati Allah, what does that mean? That means you have to obey Allah. Allah is saying, follow the Prophet. Therefore, now you come to Ati or Rasul. Now you follow the Prophet. How do you go next? You have to follow who the Prophet told you to follow. So when the Prophet said, after me, you follow Ali ibn Abi Talib, then logically it makes sense that the Ulil Amr, who you have to obey, and you don't have a choice, is none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib. So this verse of the Quran in chapter 4 verse 59 has also been revealed in honor of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. And he is the one who has been vested with authority over you. So these are the two verses today. And inshallah tomorrow we'll mention a few more verses <coughs> about the verses that we've revealed about Amir al-Mu'mineen and his reliant. Inshallah in today's Messiah I would like to remember Abu Fadl al-Abbas. But before I do that if you could recite the loudest of salam. <laughs> when it comes to Abu Fadl al Abbas, it's a very difficult Messiah for Umul Banin to hear. It's a very difficult Musibah for any lover of Abbas to hear. They say that when he was leaving Medina, his mother said to him, Oh Abbas, I need you to guarantee one thing to me that whilst you are alive, no harm shall come to Abu Abdullah. And he said, Mother, of course, 
on the day of Ashura, when the companions had fought, and the Ahlul Bayt had fought, and all the men who were able to fight had fought, when there was nobody left, and the only two people in the camp were none other than Abba Abdullah and Abu Fadl al Abbas. These were the only two that remained in the camp. At this moment, in the books of the Maqtul say that Abu Fadl al Abbas came towards Abba Abdullah and he said to him, Oh my master. Never called him brother. He said, Oh my master, can you please give me permission? so that I can go and get some water for these thirsty children. I can't bear this any longer. Imam Hussein would reply. He would say, Akhi anta hamilu liwai. Oh my brother, you are the bearer of my flag. If you die, my entire army will collapse and my enemies will rejoice. No Abbas, I can't give you permission to go. All of a sudden, Abbas hears the sounds of Al-Atash, Al-Atash, Al-Atash coming from one of the tents. What tent was it? It was the tent where the water was placed. So you know the water finished on the 7th of Muharram. So for three days they had no water. But there was a tent where they used to keep the container of the waters. To keep it away from the heat. In shade so that the water remains cool. He heard children crying Al-Atash from inside that tent. So Abbas went inside. What did he see? He saw the children of Ali Muhammad laying down on the floor, rubbing their cheeks across the sands. Why? Trying to get some moisture from where the water used to be. This broke the heart of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Immediately, he came out of the tent. He saw the four-year-old daughter, Sakina, come up to him and say, Oh, Uncle Abbas, I beg you, please, can you get us a drop of water? So he holds Sakina's hand and he walks towards Abba Abdullah. He looks at his brother. He says, oh my master, this I cannot bear this any longer. The enemies have been so injustice towards you and your family. The, the, the scene that I have just seen, I cannot live any longer, Ya Abba Abdullah. Please give me permission to go. So the Imam says to him, Akhi Abbas, If you must, O oh Abbas, Please go and get some water for these thirsty children. When Abbas was given this permission to go and get some water, immediately he mounted his horse and left for the battlefield. Everybody in Karbala said goodbye to the women and children. Abbas didn't. Why? Because Abbas was supposed to come back. Abu Fadl Abbas wasn't going to fight. So he didn't have a need to say goodbye to Zainab and Uncle Thum or to say goodbye to Sakina or Ruqayya. Abbas was going to go get some water and return back to the camp. So in Abbas's mind, he doesn't need to say goodbye. He immediately mounts his horse. He takes the water container and he marches towards the river. The books of the Maktal state, 4,000 men dispersed from the river when they saw the lion of Ali come. Abu Fadl Abbas entered into the Euphrates. He got inside, he got off the horse, he came to the river, he picked up some water with his hands and he brought them close towards his lips and then he just paused and looked at the water. At that moment, Imam Sajjad salam said that at that moment, my uncle Abbas's heart was burning like charcoal. Nobody would have blamed Abbas if he had a sip to drink. However, the enemies are looking. Abbas is holding the coolness of the water. He can feel the water. He's thirsty for three days. Yet all of a sudden, what do they see? They see Abbas opening his hands. The water falling back into the ground. Abbas filling the water container. And Abu Fadl Abbas getting up. So what do they see? They see Abbas scolding himself. What does he say? He says, Ya Naks, min ba'd al-Husayn huni, wa ba'dahu ma kunti aw takuni, hada Husaynun waridun manuni, wa tashrabina barid al-ma'ini. Oh Abbas, what worth is this life after Husayn? Oh Abbas, you want to rejuvenate your thirst while Hussein is thirsty? Your religion doesn't teach you this. So Abul Fadil Abbas filled the water container, mounted the horse again. He was still thirsty. What did he do? He tried to head towards the tents so that he could quench the thirst of Abba Abdullah and his family. All of a sudden, Ibn Ziyad comes forward and Sa'ad say, uh, Umar Ibn Sa'ad said at that moment, he says, do not let Abbas go back to the tent for if he takes the water back and Hussein is rejuvenated, he will finish all of us. So they surrounded Abbas from all sides. 
all of a sudden, Abul Fadl Abbas is fighting two men, one by the name of Hakim, one by the name of Zayd. These two individuals hid behind palm trees, awaiting for Abbas to approach. As Abul Fadl Abbas was passing the tree where Zayd was, Zayd came out and struck Abbas on his right hand, immediately severing it off. Abbas called out, Wallahi intatahtamu yameeni, inni awhami abadan andini. I swear by Allah, even if you were to cut off my right hand, you will not deter me from my path. All of a sudden, he puts the sword in his left. As he's going forward, Hakim comes out from the other palm tree. He cuts the left arm of Abbas. Abbas alayhi salam's arm falls on the ground. The sword falls with it. What does Abbas say? He says, Ya nafs, la taqshay min al-kuffari, wa habshari bi rahmat al-jabbari. Oh Abbas, do not fear the disbelievers. You are fighting for the religion of Allah. All of a sudden, he is now going towards the tent, trying to get the water there. 300 arrows, Ya Mu'mineen, were fired at Abul Fadl al Abbas. But they say three arrows hurt him the most. The first one, he says, Fi Aini, the one that hit me in my eye. He says, That arrow hurt me a lot. The second one, Fi Sadri, the arrow that pierced my heart. And then he said, The one that hurt me the most was the arrow that pierced the water skin. Because as that arrow pierced the water skin, all of the water began falling down on the sands of Karbala. The Maktal says, فَوَقَفَ الْأَبَّاسُ مُتَحَيِّرًا Abbas was perplexed. Why would Abbas the son of Ali be perplexed? It's because he has no hands to fight. <laughs> He has no water to take back to the children. He's thinking, I can't go to the camp anymore because I have no water. I can't go back to the river because I have no hands to fill the water. So Abbas stops and decides I'm not going to go any further. He stays still for a few moments. Remember there was an arrow in the eye of Abbas. Now he wants to remove the arrow. How does Abbas remove the arrow from his eye? He has no hands to remove it. So the Maktan states, Abbas knelt down to use his knees to take the arrow outside of his eye. As Abbas knelt down, his helmet fell down, exposing his head. A lion comes from behind and strikes Abbas with a metal pole on his head. He hits Abbas so hard, they say that he cracks the skull of Abul Fadl in Abbas. At this moment, Abbas falls down from the horse. And this is where we say, he has never said brother. He always said Master Hussein. This was the first time in his life. Abbas looked up. He didn't say, Assalamu alaikum ya Abba Abdullah. He said, Ahi Adirin Oh brother, come and rescue your brother. Abbas fell down. How does a man fall from the horse? He used his hands to shield and protect himself. Abbas has no hands. So how does he fall? He falls on his face. There was an arrow in the eye of Abbas. So Abbas fell to the ground to the extent that the arrow was lodged into his eye. Abbas is now laying on the plains of Karbala. He is laying there waiting for death. All of a sudden, Abba Abdullah stands up. He says, My back in Qatar Zahri. My back has now been broken with your falling, O oh Abbas. Then Abba Abdullah goes towards Abul Fadl al Abbas. First, he sees the water skin. Then he sees the two arms of Abbas. And then finally, he sees Abul Fadl al Abbas. As he's approaching Abul Fadl al Abbas, remember Abbas has an arrow in one eye. He has blood in the other eye. What does this mean? This means Abbas doesn't know who's approaching. So at this moment, Abul Fadl al Abbas doesn't know who's approaching. All he hears is footsteps. So he says, oh man, I don't know who you are, but by whoever you worship, I say to you, please don't kill me yet. Just wait until my master of Allah comes first. When he comes, then you can kill me. So the man replies back, oh Abbas, do you not recognize me? It is your brother Hussein. I have come to see you. Abbas Abdullah throws himself onto the body of Abbas. He begins to cry. He says, oh Abbas, after your death, my army has collapsed. What will I do? All the enemies surrounded him on Hussein and the Maktil says they began laughing, they began rejoicing, they began singing at the top of their lungs. What were they saying? They were saying we have killed Abbas, therefore we have broken Hussein. 
So at that moment, Abba Abdullah takes the head of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and he places it onto his lap. Abbas removes it. Then he places it again. Abbas removes it. So Imam Hussein said, Okay, Abbas, what are you doing? Why are you not allowing me to comfort you in your final moments? Abbas looks out. He says, Ya Abba Abdullah, and now, right now at the time of death, you are here to comfort me. Yet in a few moments, oh my master, you will be on the plains of Karbala. Shimmer will be on your chest. Oh, Allah Abdullah, who will be there to comfort you? Which means, even at the time of death, even at the time of his soul leaving, Abbas was still thinking about Abba Abdullah. So the Imam asks, Ya Abbas, do you have any last requests? Ya Abbas, do you have a final wish? He says, I have a wish, Ya Abba Abdullah. Do not take my body back to the tent. <laughs> Abba Abdullah, you've taken everybody to the tent, don't take me back. Why? He said, because I am embarrassed, I am ashamed. Why are you ashamed, our Abbas? He said, because Sakina asked for water, I am unable to provide her with water. Therefore, I feel ashamed. I don't know how I will return, so just leave my body here. That's it, leave it here. So Imam Hussein, when his final moments of Abbas passes away in the lap of his brother, Imam Hussein places him down, he gets up, he's walking back towards the tent. There was an alam that Abbas had, the flag of the army. Abba Abdullah picked up that flag as he was walking back towards the tent from a distance. Sakina sees what? She sees that there is a flag coming. So what does she think? She thinks that her uncle Abbas is returning with water. So what does she do? She calls all the children. She says, hurry up, hurry up. I can see my uncle Abbas is coming. Therefore, we will all drink water. We will all quench our thirst. But as that alum came close, Sakina noticed that it wasn't her uncle, but it was Abba Abdullah. The books of the Maktil say, Abba Abdullah didn't say anything. He was using the sleeve of his shirt to wipe the tears from his eyes. As he was walking in, Sakina comes forward. She says, Abata, Abata, ain't on me. Oh my God, oh my father, where is my uncle Abbas? Imam Hussein doesn't say anything. Sakina turns towards Aunt Zainab. She says, Abba Zainab, where is Abbas? Say the Zainab comes out, he says, Akhi, Akhi, Abba Abdullah, where is my brother Abbas? Imam Hussein is so grief stricken at this moment, he doesn't know what to say, so he remains quiet. He walks towards the tent of Abbas. There was a metal pole that was holding up the tent. Abba Abdullah holds the pole, he pulls it out, the, the tent collapses. This was his way of saying that Abbas is no longer alive, and that Abbas has left this world. When the women saw the tent of Abbas fall, all of them began to scream and shout. They began to cry. What did they say? Final words. They say that whenever a Shaheed would die in Karbala, the women would cry by saying the name of that Shaheed. So when Ali ibn Akbar died, they said, Wa Akbara. When Aum died and Muhammad died, they said, Wa Auna Wa Muhammada. When Qasim died, they said, Wa Qasima. But when Abu al Abbas died, they didn't say, Wa Abbasa. The books of the Maktan state that Zainab looked towards the battlefield and she cried and said, Wa Hijaba. My hijab is going to be taken. But now that Abu al Abbas has gone, Sakina comes forward and she says something that breaks our heart. Final words. She says, Oh my father, is my uncle Abbas dead because of me? Has Abbas died because I asked for water? Am I responsible? So Abba Abdullah says, no. She says, oh father, I promise you, I will never ask for water again. I promise you I will die thirsty. I just have one request. Can you please bring my uncle back? I will never drink water again.